Global governance is a term used to describe a movement that brings together diverse actors to coordinate collective action at the level of the planet. Today, we are from Group 4 and we will be tackling about global governance, its institutions, and the different definitions and even the role of the United Nations in global governance. So what is global governance? Global governance examines the gaps in the international system for managing complex issues and to engage stakeholders on practical steps for collective problem solving. Global governance also provides global public goods, particular peace and security, justice and mediation system for conflict, functioning markets, and unified standard for trade and industry. Under global governance, there are three institutions. The first one is the United Nations or UN. The United Nations is founded in 1945 after the Second World War. It is an intergovernmental organization that aims to maintain international peace and security, developing friendly relations among nations, and promoting social progress, better living standards, and human rights. Um, the second institution is the International Criminal Court or ICC. ICC investigates and, where warranted, tries individuals charged with the gravest crimes of concern to the international community. These crimes are genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. The last one is the World Bank. The World Bank is one of the largest sources of funding and knowledge for developing countries. Um, there are five institutions in World Bank that share a commitment to reducing poverty, increasing shared prosperity, and promoting sustainable development. Although assisting financially in big scale, they primarily cater to middle-income and low-income countries. So the next part is the different definitions of global governance. Having different perspectives, Global governance can be defined in numerous ways. Global governance is the process of designating laws or rules or regulations intended for a global scale. It means that there is acceleration of worldwide interdependence both between human societies and between humankind and the biosphere. Moreover, Global governance is used to designate all regulations intended for organization and centralization of human societies, and in that sense, it is also the management of global processes in the absence of a global government. According to Thomas G. Weiss, global governance refers to concrete cooperative problem-solving arrangements, many of which increasingly involve not only the United Nations of States, but also other namely international secretariats and other non-state actors. Furthermore, it refers to the way in which global affairs are managed, which correspondingly explains that global governance is also an international process of consensus forming, which generates guidelines and agreements that affect national government and international cooperation. Global governance is not a singular system that governs the whole world but the various systems of global governance have similarities that is why it can be said that global governance is not a world government. In a book entitled Modern Organizational Governance, global governance pertains to the political interaction that is required to solve problems that affect more than one state or region when there is no power to enforce compliance. This definition can be taken in the context of the various state governments having legitimate monopoly on the use of force, on the power of enforcement. Let us now proceed to the United Nations. So now, I will be discussing the background and how the United Nations was formed. And it all started with a horrible war called World War I. All of the world's superpowers were at it, and it was supposed to be the code WARS to end all wars. So what is the main goal of the League of Nations? The main goal of the League of Nations was to create world peace. However, 
it ended up failing because some countries left the league and caused it to crumble as it ultimately failed to prevent what became known as World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, World War II was the world's worst history as it took many lives. So let us now proceed to the three conferences. Two of the Allies, the United States and the United Kingdom, led the way in August 1941. The American President Franklin Roosevelt and the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill met up in New England to create Atlantic Charter. One of the conferences that I will be discussing is the Atlantic Charter. It stated new idealistic goals for the world after the war was over. And there are agreements under the Atlantic Charter, and these are the followings. First, their countries seek no expansion, territorial or others. Second, they desire to see no territorial changes. Third, they must respect the right of all peoples. Fourth, they will respect and pursue to have equal terms. Fifth, to bring out the fullest collaboration between all nations. Sixth is a hope to see established peace, which will afford to all nations. Seventh, to enable the people to traverse the high seas and oceans without hindrance. And lastly, to abandon the use of force for violence. On New Year's Day 1942, at the Arcadia Conference in Washington, D.C., 26 different countries from around the world agreed to sign the declaration by the United Nations. The document pledged that the 26 countries led by the quote Big Four, the United States, United Kingdom, Soviet Union, and China would join forces to defeat totalitarianism, specifically quote, Hitlerism. By the end of World War II, 21 countries had agreed to the declaration and even former friends of the Axis powers wished to sign the declaration but not allowed to. Moreover, Europe and Pacific Ocean heads of states, diplomats, generals, and government officials met several times with the goal of creating another international organization to keep the peace. And that is the Dumberton Conference. The Dumberton Oaks Conference in 1944 was held in Dumberton Oaks in a mansion in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., where representatives of China, Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom formulated proposals for a world organization that became the basis for the United Nations. The Dumberton Oaks proposals in this matter did not furnish a complete blueprint for the United Nations, in which they have failed to provide an agreement on crucial questions such as the voting system of the proposed Security Council and the membership provisions for the Constituted Republic of the Soviet Union. Thus, another conference was held, which is the Yalta Conference. The third conference that I will be discussing is the Yalta Conference in Crimea. The Yalta Conference held on 1945 resolved the issues on the Dumberton Oaks Conference. Moreover, this conference resulted in the proposal of a trusteeship system under the new agency to take the place of League of Nations mandate system. The proposals on this conference supplemented the form basis of negotiations at the San Francisco Conference, out of which came the Charter of the United Nations in 1945. So the next part that we are going to talk about are the purposes of the United Nations. Originally, there are only four purposes of the United Nations, but we can separate one into two, which makes it five. So the first purpose of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security. Uh, an example of this was when the United Nations Security Council took action with the North Korea's nuclear and missile activities by adopting nine sanction resolutions against North Korea in order to maintain peace and security among other nations. The second purpose of the United Nations is to develop friendly relations among nations based on equal rights and self-determination of people and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen peace. 
An example of this is every time they held a convention to strengthen peace among nations. Third purpose uh, of the United Nations is to achieve cooperation in solving international, economic, social, cultural, and humanitarian problems. An example of this could be their projects to deliver humanitarian aid to people that are hungry, sick, and etc. The fourth purpose of the United Nations is to promote and encourage respect for human rights and fundamental freedom for all without distinctions to race, sex, language, or religion. An example of this is through their conventions that are held to promote human rights. Another example of this is when the United Nations launched a comprehensive review on the Philippine drug war. The last purpose of the United Nations is to be the center for harmonizing the actions of the nation in achieving these ends. An example of this could be when the United Nations mobilized a global fight against COVID-19. There are five basic principles underlying the United Nations. The first basic principle is all member states are sovereign and equal. The Security Council under the United Nations develops friendly international relations that respect the sovereign equality of its members. This deals with the right of each country to decide for their own government, which may relate to the questions of independence, autonomy, elections, and the legitimacy of governments. The second basic principle is in all international relations, no member shall use force or threaten force against the territory and political independence of any state or behave in a manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. The Foundational Treaty of the United Nations, also known as the Charter, prohibits the threat or use of force and calls on all members to respect the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of other states. This covers some instances in the context of inter- or interstate violence, war, or other territorial conflicts. The third basic principle is all member states pledge to fulfill their obligations under the Charter in good faith. The Charter states that members are obliged to give assistance to the United Nations and refrain from assisting states targeted with preventive or enforcement action. This features some instances such as calls for refraining from actions that could be considered as providing assistance to a state under council action. The fourth basic principle is, as it is necessary to preserve peace and security, the United Nations shall ensure that countries which are not members act in accordance with the principles of the Charter. The Charter states that the organization needs to ensure that non-United Nations members act in accordance with its principles. This covers instances where the Security Council had addressed itself to non-members of the United Nations. The fifth basic principle is the United Nations shall not intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state except when it's acting to enforce peace. The Charter states that the United Nations has no authority to intervene in domestic affairs of any state, while this principle shall not prejudice the application of enforcement measures. This covers those cases where this principle of non-intervention by the United Nations was raised and the authority of the Council to involve itself in a particular situation was questioned. So the next part that we are going to talk about are the principal organs of the United Nations. Basically, there are six principal organs of the United Nations. First, the General Assembly. Second, the Security Council. Third, the Economic and Social Council. Fourth is the Trusteeship Council. Fifth is the International Court of Justice. Sixth is the Secretariat. Uh, and my group mates will elaborately discuss each of the principal organs of the United Nations. And here is Karen to discuss about the first principal organ of the United Nations. The General Assembly was created in 1945. 
It is the heart of the United Nations because this is where key decisions are made that affect member states. The General Assembly comprises 193 member states, where member countries have an equal voice in decision-making in subjects about international peace and security, including development, disarmament, human rights, international law, and the peaceful arbitration of disputes between nations. It also appoints the United Nations Secretary General and elects the non-permanent members of the Security Council. There are more than 500 treaties that have been created under the Assembly, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948, the Sustainable Development Goals back in 2015 that serves as a path to eradicate poverty and address climate change by the year of 2030. The General Assembly also featured a signing ceremony for the new treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, UN reform, climate change, preventing sexual exploitation and abuse, and women's economic empowerment. The Security Council takes the lead in determining the existence of a threat to the peace or, or act of aggression. It calls upon the parties to a dispute to settle it by peaceful means and recommends methods of adjustments or terms of settlement. In some cases, the Security Council can resort imposing sanctions or even authorize the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. Security Council also has 15 members, 10 non-permanent and 5 permanent members with veto power, the China, the Russian Federation, United Kingdom of Great Britain, and Northern Ireland and the United States of America. The Economic and Social Council was established by the United Nations Charter in 1945, which was amended in 1965 and 1974 to increase the number of members from 18 to 54. The Council was designed to be the United Nations' main venue for the discussion of international economic and social issues. They are the one who is responsible for promoting higher standards of living, full employment, economic, and social progress, identifying the solutions of international economic, social and health problems, facilitating international cultural, educational cooperation, and encouraging universal respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Next is the Traceeship Council. The Traceeship Council was one of the main organizations of the United Nations and was established to supervise the administration of trust territories as they transition from colonies to sovereign nations. Under the Charter, the Traceeship Council is authorized to examine and discuss reports from the administering authority on the political, economic, social, and educational advancement of people of trust territories and in consultation with the administering authority to examine petitions from the undertake periodic and other special mission to trust territories. The International Court of Justice was established in June 1945 by the Charter of the United Nations and began work in April 1946. The seat of the court is at the Peace Palace in The Hague, Netherlands of the six principal organs of United Nations. It is the only one not located in New York. The court's role is to settle, in accordance with international law, legal disputes submitted to it by the states and to give advisory opinions on legal questions referred to it by the authorized United Nations organs and specialized agencies. The International Court of Justice has jurisdiction in two types of cases contentious cases between states in which the court produces binding rulings between states that agree to submit to the ruling of the court and advisory opinions which provide reason but non-binding ruling on properly submitted questions to international law usually at the request of United Nations General Assembly. So the last principle of Oregon of the United Nations which I will tackle about is the Secretariat. This is one of the main organs of the United Nations which is organized along the departmental lines with each department or office having a distinct area of action and responsibility. 
offices and departments coordinate with each other to ensure cohesion as they carry out the day-to-day -day work of the organization in offices and duty stations around the world. At the head of the United Nations Secretariat is the Secretary General. As an organization that primarily aims the maintenance of international peace and security, the United Nations is also faced with challenges. The biggest question is, how can the United Nations be an effective channel to attain lasting peace and security in the world? As further discussed a while ago, there are organs of the United Nations that work in order to prevent conflicts, primarily the Security Council. The United Nations can become an effective medium to achieve lasting peace and security in the world because they are the organization that acts as a middleman in helping parties in conflict make peace, creating the conditions to prompt the upholding and flourishing of peace. These acts reinforced by the United Nations in order to be an effective measure, work together and reinforce one another.